Well, thanks. In the next 15 minutes here, you're going to learn how to create new life forms, never before seen on Earth. You're going to learn how to interrogate the world around you at a basic genetic level. And when I say you, I'm not talking about highly trained biologists. I'm not talking about scientists. I'm talking about you, whose last biology course might have been in high school 30 years ago. Biology is becoming a technology, not just a science. And as such, it's becoming much more accessible to people. A few years ago, I left Microsoft. I was there about 10 years uh, working on speech recognition systems with an urge to come back to school and study biology. And the reason I did so is because biology is becoming an information science. I had been working at Microsoft Research, uh, taking product ideas, moving them out to uh, people, uh, and uh, seeing that uh, what I was doing in the computer realm could be applied to the realm of life. And suddenly, computers didn't seem like quite the place to be as much as biology and where life is created. So let me give you an example of uh, a, how another science has become a technology. Electronics, still nominally a branch of physics, but you don't think about that as you're pushing the play button on your uh, DVD player. You're just using a technology. I would argue even that the person who is designing that DVD player is not thinking about physics. They're taking, thinking about taking components and plugging them together into circuits and making something that works. They're using a technology. And as a science progresses more and more into a mature technology, it becomes accessible to more and more people. And biology is really right now, right at the knee of that curve where it's becoming accessible to everybody, everybody in the world. And just like you wouldn't design a DVD player that was just tuned towards DVD and electronics technicians, if you did, it'd have bells and whistles and dials coming out here to tell you all what's going on under the covers. You don't design biology just to meet the needs of biologists. All of you are the people who are designing biology for the problems that you have in the world. And so that's why it's so important that we do this in an open source way where it's accessible to everybody. Let me give you a couple of examples of accessible biology technology projects. A couple of years, two girls in high school in New York City wanted to come up with a science fair project. And they decided to base this project on the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This is basically a process where you amplify DNA. It's a DNA photocopier, where you, uh, you take a little section of DNA that you uh, tightly specify and amplify it up so that you can sequence it. Well, with this, you can do a technique called DNA barcoding. And the section that you amplify up is a section that varies between species. So you amplify up a, a section from one species and look it up in a database, and you can tell what it is that uh, you took the DNA from. Well, they did this with fish in the fish markets and the sushi restaurants around New York City and wanted to see what it was they were eating. And surprise, surprise, it wasn't what it was advertised most of the time. White tuna was never white tuna. White tuna is tilapia, about an eighth of the price. <laughs> and so they were able to do this as a science fair project, two high school girls. So another project that's showing the technology of biology, people don't really understand all the process in tomatoes that create lycopene, an important antioxidant. But there's a lot of it there. Some researchers at Harvard University developed a directed evolution process where they basically rapidly mutate a tomato in the direction they want it to mutate to optimize the lycopene pathway. Well, in a very short period of time, without knowing exactly how they were going about making these changes, they evolved a tomato that had 1,000 times the lycopene as the tomato in your garden. We're able to make almost arbitrary changes in the biology of life today. And it's just expanding at an incredible rate. So I taught a class at BioCurious this last summer on how to make things glow green. This cat you see up on the, uh, the screen, uh, this wasn't our creation. This was some researchers who uh, put a reporter gene into a cat to see if their therapeutic DNA was carried into all the tissues that, it, uh, that, that they wanted. And you can see that it was. Boy, I'd hate to wake up at 2 a.m. with this looming over my pillow. <laughs> um, but in this introductory class, we wanted to give people all the same thrill of creating green things without kind of the ethical and regulatory problems of working with cats, of course. <laughs> So we had them work on bacteria. We had them take an E. coli and insert the green fluorescent protein from jellyfish to make that E. coli turn green. And I'm going to share with you the way that we did this. So a little circular piece of DNA is called a plasmid. And you create a plasmid by pulling DNA out of some other organism uh, and wrapping it up in this packaging that tells it how to reproduce and plugging it into a bacteria. Now, you have to do a few things to get it into your bacteria. You have to get the cell wall in this bacteria to open up its pores to let new DNA in. 
The way this is done in most professional biology labs is by shocking it. You use this high voltage electroshock equipment and shock the bacteria and 95% of them die. But the 5% that are still alive let the bacteria in and accept the new DNA. Well, we're working at a biohacker space, kind of this grassroots community lab, and we don't want to do things the, uh, uh, the high precision expensive way. Yeah, we want to do it the, uh, the cheap accessible way. And so I went to the drugstore and got a laxative, polyethylene glycol. It's sold over the counter. It's the same ingredient that's in uh, antifreeze, and you're told not to let your dog lick it up because it makes the intestinal cell wall expand and they die of diarrhea. Well, we're using that same property yeah, and uh, getting our bacteria to take up polyethylene glycol, and it makes their cell wall pores expand so that our DNA can sneak through. The other thing you have to do is neutralize the charges. You've got negative charges on the backbone of your DNA and negative charges in the cell wall, and normally these will repel each other. But if you put positive ions into your buffer, you can neutralize that repulsion. So we used Epsom salts, again from the drugstore. So using all drugstore ingredients, we're able to take a new plasmid, introduce it into this bacteria, and have a whole new form of life created. Now, we just chose the uh, bacteria, or the uh, plasmid, rather, that uh, we gave to the students. We didn't actually engineer this plasmid. But it's indicative of the way that you create all sorts of new life forms, because the way that you design these things today is not by going out and finding a jellyfish and snipping out the DNA and putting it back together. You design it on the computer, in silico. Biology has become an information science. You send your email off to a DNA synthesis company, and for sometimes as little as a couple hundred dollars, a week later, later you get a little vial of DNA that you put into your organism. All sorts of things you can do with these. And this is happening in the hackerspaces. Hackerspaces are these amazing geek paradise technology playgrounds. It's basically where you go to have fun with technology and share it with a diverse set of people. And the more diverse set of people you have playing, the more amazing things come out of your hackerspace. We created the Victoria Makerspace about a year ago, and when we did so, it was about the 10,000th hackerspace in the world. So this is a movement that's really gathering steam. Our hackerspace here in Victoria has a lot of the usual uh, computer-aided manufacturing tools. We've got a laser cutter, a 3D printer, a vinyl cutter. We've got a wood shop, a metal shop, a welder. But up until very, very recently, what we didn't have were bi biology facilities. And really, my inspiration for this were a couple of hackerspaces in the US. GenSpace was the first one in New York City, and then BioCurious was the second. I spent last summer down at BioCurious building their lab and teaching classes there, the first two classes there. The first one I told you about a minute ago. I'll talk about a PCR class a little bit later. But they're a little bit ahead of where we are at, here at uh, the Makerspace in getting biology broadly disseminated to the community. They used a crowdfunding source uh, called Kickstarter. You'll hear about that from Victoria later in uh, today's talks. Uh, to get some funding for this, uh, uh, this lab uh, and put together a very nice industrial space. Uh, and Silicon Valley is just awash with resources. Uh, so they've got a lot of people coming in, teaching classes, taking classes, and putting together group projects. And group projects that really have people that are not professional scientists coming together to say, what would they like solved? So some of their group projects, for instance, uh, they've got a bunch of people developing kombucha cultures. Uh, kombucha is a health drink. And uh, different lineages of kombucha have different uh, uh, sets of bacteria and yeast that go together to give the health benefits. So they're categorizing these and figuring out what's in those kombucha cultures. They're looking at coffee and tea and honey and determining what toxins are in there and what nutrients are in there. Things that really you want to know, but you haven't had the lab resources or the techniques to go find out before. And these are problems that people are coming in with. They're even finding ways of turning playing in the lab in these hacker spaces into a new model of businesses. There's a site called Innocentive that publishes science challenges and sets dollar figures next to them. So for instance, there's a science challenge to develop a more nutritious vegetable by these same genetic engineering techniques. Not something that will resist pesticides like uh, Roundup Ready soybeans, or, or, but something that will do you good, be more nutritious for you to eat. And there's a $50,000 price tag attached to this. So you can take these scientific challenges, gather a group of diverse people in a hacker space, solve those challenges, get a paycheck from it, turn around and go off to your next fun problem. It's kind of like a casual company in some ways. So I want to talk now about the next class that I taught. PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Two of the people on the board at uh, BioCurious were the inventors of the open PCR machine. This is a Kickstarter funded open source polymerase chain uh, reaction machine. Basically, the polymerase chain reaction is a process of very tightly controlling the temperature that you're subjecting uh, the DNA that you want to amplify to in the presence of an enzyme. And so it heats up and cools down. And every heating and cooling cycle, it creates more copies of this. 
So that after about 30 cycles from one piece of template DNA, you have over a billion copies of DNA. And what you do is you amplify just the section you want. We brought 24 students into the class uh, and asked them to uh, look at one of two genes, either the actin-3 gene. This is the fast twitch, slow twitch muscle gene. Most sprinters have a fast twitch version of this. Most marathon runners, a slow twitch version. Or we allowed them to look at BRCA1. Now, BRCA1 is probably the scariest gene in your body you can look at. In large part, it determines cancer risk to a number of cancers. It's involved in mutational repair. And so if you have a BRCA1 mutation, you're much more susceptible to breast cancer, or ovarian cancer, or prostate cancer, any, and any number of other cancers. Now, a lot of ethicists would tell you that you don't want to let amateurs look at medically relevant genes in the lab on their own. You'll scare them. They might lose control of the information. It might go on Facebook, and they'll never be able to get health insurance again. This is in the US. Uh, they, they, they might uh, learn that they have a mutation and be horribly scarred by this and go have, uh, have surgery to remove their breast because they're feared they, that someday they'll get, they'll get cancer in it. Uh, bad things can happen. And we went through all the bad things that could happen and explained uh, why they didn't want to do this, did everything we could to talk them out of doing this. Still, two-thirds of the students decided it was BRCA1 they wanted to look at. We couldn't talk them out of it. What this tells me is that people really want control of their own genetic information. They want to be able to look at it themselves. It's theirs. They should be able to see it. And we gave them the ability to do this. What it did was made medical informatics much more up close and personal, something that they can operate on, not something they got a prescription to go to the doctor for, or to go to the hospital and have blood drawn and have to talk to their insurance company, something they could do. Well, there's another industry that's gone through the transition from a large impersonal industry to something that everybody is carrying. That's the computer industry. In 1958, Thomas J. Watson said there's a world market for about five computers. Now I suspect there's only a handful of you in this room that doesn't have one in their pocket. The difference is, and, and, and so where we are in, in, in biology is, uh, I like to liken it to where we were in the 1970s with the start of the homebrew hacker club. The things we're making today are kind of like the Altair up on the uh, upper uh, picture there. Uh, a few flashing lights and a few uh, switches, but it doesn't actually do much of anything. It might glow green, but it's not going to solve world hunger. But pretty soon out of the Homebrew Hardware Club uh, came things like the Apple One. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak created the biggest company in the world out of these clubs. So bringing things down to the grassroots can really create new industries. The difference between the biotech industry and the computer industry is that the fundamental curve of acceleration in the computer industry has been Moore's law. This is the statement that every 18 months to two years, processing power for a bit given amount of money doubles. Moore's law is the line at the top of this logarithmic graph that looks almost flat. Sequencing is expanding just exponentially. It was following Moore's law until about 2007, and then it was like dropping off a cliff. And it's getting incredibly cheap, incredibly quickly. This picture shows some of the same data and shows that in 2006, it would have cost you about $10 million to sequence your own genome, the full three gigabases of DNA in one person. Today, that cost is about $5,000. By the end of 2012, we're expecting to see the $1,000 genome. It's getting incredibly cheap, incredibly quickly, and this is the thing that is driving the entire field of biology at this point. So there's another reason that I'm trying to start these grassroots movements of biology experimentation, to start these new industries and new businesses based off working with biology for everybody, not just the professional biologists. That is that there are huge, huge investments being made in biology on a global level at this point. In 2011, by the end of the year, we're expected to see 30,000 genomes sequenced just in this year alone. Of those 30,000 genomes, over a quarter of them are coming from one institution, the Beijing Genomic Institute. In order for North America to remain competitive in this emerging space of biotechnology, and it is an emerging technology revolution, we need to push this down to the grassroots, get people experimenting, get people innovating, getting people to solve the problems that they feel are important to them. Not big institutional biology, not big science, not big medicine, but the problems that are important to you. What do you want? If you could play God and create the organism you wanted to solve your problems, what would that look like? Would it be a more nutritious vegetable? Would it be solving a health problem? Would it be solving an infestation in your garden? Would it be just identifying the species of mite that's infesting your orchid? What problem is important to you? And you can have control over all these things. The resources to do it are close at hand in your local biohacker space. So come take classes, come play, come learn how to create new life forms, come learn how to interrogate the world around you. 
But most of all, come have fun and play with technology in the hacker spaces. Thanks.